Hi, this is Donna Mills. You are listening to TV Confidential. Fred Robertson along with Greg Garibar welcoming you back to TV Confidential Radio Talk Show about television that is happy to welcome Mr. Michael Bell. Michael Bell once described, uh, an actor once described as the Artemis Gordon of voice actors. Michael Bell, also one of the most prolific and enduring voice actors in the history of film and TV animation. Michael began his career as a voice actor in the early 1970s. He provided the voices for the Houndcats, Speed Bucky, the Saturday Superstar movie, the Scooby-Doo movies, many other Saturday morning cartoons produced by Hanna-Barbera. He was the voice of Plastic Man and Baby Plaz on the Plastic Man comedy adventure show. He was also the voice of Zan and Gleek on Super Friends, the voice of the Riddler on the Challenge of the Super Friends, a host of other characters on such shows as the Smurfs, the Transformers, the Transformers the Movie, G.I. Joe the Movie, G.I. Joe Real American Hero, far too many other cartoon shows to mention. If you never watch Saturday morning cartoons, you'll probably remember Michael as the voice of the Parquet Tub on the Parquet butter. Marcher and <laughs> Butter. There you go. Michael, was, Michael just gave us an impromptu butter. Uh, he also has a long, long list of screen credits. Uh, among other things, he was Les Crowley, Bobby Ewing's banker on the original Dallas. He also appeared on such popular me- uh, network shows as The Rockford Files, The FBI, Ironside, Mannix, Star Trek, Deep Space Nine, Star Trek, The Next Generation, others. Far too many to mention. Michael Bell, thank you for spending a few minutes of your day and joining us on TV Confidential. Well, this is my first three-way since Three's Company. <laughs> <laughs> Three's Company, another show that you worked on at the time. Yeah, sure. It's interesting, like so many things in life and, and like so many things in the, in the world of entertainment, your career in voice animation was very much a happy accident in that uh, when you first came to Hollywood, you you did not necessarily say, I want to be a voice actor. You know, you you pursued screen roles, but your career in voice work came along kind of as an accident. Yeah, well, you know, interesting at that time, the only voice people, of course, were Mel and Dawes, were the big ones, of course, and uh, and, uh, June Foray, and there were very few people during that period of time. It wasn't something that you would seek out. It was sort of an alien world for most people, just especially young guys and young girls that wanted to be actors on screen and movie stars and you know, and get all that visible personality stuff. So uh, it wasn't anything that was in was in my playbook. But eventually, uh, it happened. I mean, I I did a film a long time ago, which somebody just unearthed on Facebook called Summer of 63, but in reality, it was finally called Damaged Good, where I get syphilis. And uh, that's very embarrassing. Um, I wound up playing a character who gets syphilis. And, uh, <laughs> and this Damaged Good, was, uh, I think I make a, I made 100 bucks a week. We filmed it in Banning, California, which, good guys, you wouldn't want to do anything there, maybe except start a fire. So, uh, in reality, that that was the beginning, and then after a while, you know, got involved with the uh, studio, and uh, got lucky and did plays, and wound up doing a lot of on-camera stuff, and then voiceovers came along. I met a young lady who said, you, you're too talented to do on-camera stuff. You should be doing voices. You do all these great characters. And I said, okay, uh, set me in that direction, and she did. You, you, you mentioned Banning, California, and... Uh, Stay with me on this. The only reason I know about Banning, California, is there was an episode of the FBI, the old Quinn Martin show, right. uh, that was set in Banning, California. I have your disclosure. The listeners know this. You don't know this. I'm working on a book, a behind-the-scenes look of the history of the FBI by Quinn Martin. So, okay. uh, w- okay. w- w- one of the shows was set in Banning, California. And so being a curious guy, I looked it up and I'd never heard of the town. It's somewhere up in the, it's somewhere, somewhere up in Northern California, Contra Costa County, if I remember correctly. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But listen, I was a young guy and it was a movie and they were offering me a hundred dollars a week. Yeah. A hundred dollars a week in 1960s, 1970 money. That's, you know, it's not a lot, but still a lot. It, it went a lot more than it, than, than it would today. It was 
grade and I did three, two, two weeks, I think it was, or something, or five days or six hours, I can't even remember. All I know is <laughs> it was god awful. I only learned years later that the fellow who did it was anti, anti-gay, anti-smoke, anti-weed, anti-everything that we are all pro today. And it was so interesting. It was an interesting time. Well, we are pro. We are pro Michael Bell. Michael Bell, uh, the prolific, one of the most prolific, one of the most enduring voice actors in film and uh, TV animation. As we are recording this conversation, Michael is about to travel, or at least he's scheduled to travel uh, to uh, Louisville, Kentucky. He's well, he'll be appearing at the Galaxy Con in Louisville. I leave tomorrow, yeah. Yes, he leaves tomorrow as we speak. Uh, Michael Bell is on Twitter, at Michael Bell uh, VO. Uh, you can also uh, follow Michael's calendar and learn about the uh, the classes that Michael teaches in voiceover by going to michaelbellvoices.com, michaelbellvoices.com. Greg, you being the animation expert, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you. Cool. Well, Michael, I don't know how many people ever ask, but as the voice of Zan, the Wonder Twin, yeah, he would turn into water stuff. But yeah. where would he get the buckets? <laughs> you know, it, it's it's really true. No one ever thought about that. I guess if I had brought up the issue at the time, they would have told me to shut up and got somebody else. <laughs> 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 with the bucket, uh, I do know that I finally I finally turned to Louise, uh, who was uh, Jana, and I said, uh, "You get to do animals and wildlife and stuff." And I'm always I'm, I'm a mountain of jello, for a, <laughs> you know, a frozen waterfall. And finally, after about maybe twenty shows or thirty shows, one time when Gordon Hunt was directing, and I had to go, you know, form of, and it was, I knew it was a, a water well or whatever it was. Form of urine. And he went, what? <laughs> what did you say? I said, well, you know, that's water. I just, this guy, let's, let's cover the whole area. Let's get a little edgy here. You know, we're not going to get that edgy, Mike. Let's redo that one. So, anyway. Well, when uh, when Warner brings it back, you know, like Harvey Birdman or something, or... Oh sure, uh, they won't use me. I'll play the I'll play Zan's father. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there's just so many characters to ask about now. Believe it or not, you this may surprise you, but uh, Ed and I talk a lot about some of the cartoons that have been issued on DVD that not everybody talks about. For example, or, or they should talk about more. For example, we did an extensive discussion about the Quickie Koala show. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right, of course. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. No, I'm not making Koala. this up. Oh, wow. yeah. I am not kidding. But also Hound Cats. I mean, you know, it's... Well, so you know what? Fun. We did the... I believe... Yes, we did, Dad. Didn't we do Hound Cats? I'm I think sh- we did. Uh, if, if, if not, it is in the mix. Well, yeah, we did... Classic Man, of course. Did. Plastic, yes, yeah, I I believe we did do I believe we did do Plastic Man. We did, we yeah, and and with Quickie Koala, I wanted to ask you where you got that Ranger voice because he sounds it's such a distinctive voice. Is that like some relative or something? Because he would spout this knowledge and he had this like really, it's a voice I'd never heard you do before. I'm it, trying it, to remember if I remember wasn't it kind of New Yorky. Kind of, I talk like this, kind of thing like that. I'm trying to remember because I played a couple of Rangers for Hanna Barbera, and I remember there was one where I did my Aunt Pauline, uh, and she would say to me when I'd get into town and I was in the army or something, and I'd come into town and visit my relatives in Yoshio, Oh, hi, sweetheart, how are you? I'll look, we've got to come over for dinner. Everybody's going to get looking forward to seeing you. And, and so when I had to do one of the Rangers, I wound up doing that. Being angry, I think I was angry. <laughs> was quick to call. I think that's what it was. Oh, that that's absolutely. See, that's like my aunt Sadie. See that? Yeah. There you go. Well, Sadie, Pauline, you, you know, whatever. She heard. You know, hi, darling. How are you? Oh, you. We got to see you. You are you in town? Oh my God! You know, is that kind of. <laughs> 
Well, you heard it here first, folks. And you heard it from Michael Bell. Michael Bell, one of the most prolific, one of the most enduring voice actors in film and television. With We, we could easily fill up the entire two-hour program just listing Michael's credits, and we would only scratch the surface. Uh, you can follow Michael Bell on Twitter at Michael Bell VO uh, for more information on Michael, for more of his upcoming appearances, for more on the classes and voiceover that Michael teaches. Go to MichaelBellVoices.com, MichaelBellVoices.com. I think you brought up Plastic Man, Michael. I understand that if you had to pick a favorite, that's one of your favorite uh, voices and, and, and roles that you've done in your it's career. Interesting. They asked me to do when I when I went out to when I went to do that. They wanted a kind of interesting sound. I said, I don't know what to come up with. This guy, just you know, being close to me, or just you know, working with a stilted, a little more of a stilted sound, you know, just sharper, whatever it is, because you play heroes, you got to sound like a hero. So uh, I really wasn't quite sure where to go with that, except that it was such a favorite of mine as a kid in terms of comic books. He's one of my faves. So it was such a treat for me to be able to give a voice to him. And, of course, Baby Plath. And, of course, because the show only had, I think, uh, three of us, myself and uh, Melinda and Joe, uh, we, um, we wound up, I wound up actually doing all the character voices that, uh, that came in under Plath. So I had to wind up doing all the heavies. The visiting heavy. Greg and I have talked about how when you voice a you know an animated show, sometimes you are working in the same room with the actor and you're able to play off the actor and sometimes you're isolated, you know, because because you know it's not it's not always possible to get you and Melendi Britt in the same room at the same time in order to record Plastic Man or whatever show you're working on. I mean, do, do you remember how you put those shows together when you voiced those? Well, yeah, those shows well up to, uh, I think, well up to uh, Rugrats. We were, we were, it was in groups. I mean, we worked like a radio show, literally. Everything we did at Anna Barbera was like a radio show. Uh, at the Patty Freeling was like a radio show. Marvel, like a radio show. It was only years later that when they started to turn out so much product and, and we were all there weren't as many actors out there doing it. So we found ourselves working against each other. We literally had to run out the door to get for another job that we got. So we wound up uh, doing it on a time capsule. Uh, just, uh, you know, do Mike now, do Frank later, do, uh, you know, somebody else, you know, at another time. So we wound up working by ourselves. And it wasn't as much fun, frankly, because you didn't know what the other character's response was. Or you didn't know what your response should be to the other character's line because you didn't know how they delivered it. Yeah, and it, it underscores the fact that voice acting is acting. And acting is, I mean, I'm not an actor. I'm just a guy who talks to actors. But acting is reacting to your fellow actor. And it's very difficult yeah. to do that if you're working in isolation. That's the first thing we learned in, uh, I went to the High School of Performing Arts in New York. It's the first thing we learned was acting is reacting. So when uh, I had to do, when they cast me in Rugrats, and they said, you're going to play Chucky's dad, Chaz, I said, well, what does Christina sound like? I don't know what she's doing as as, uh, as Chucky. So they played it back for me before we even got a chance to, to work on it together, and uh, and I heard her voice, which was kind of that little nasal thing that she did, a little crackly sound, and I went, oh, okay, I'm, I'm going to have Chucky's dad sound the same way. I'll have Chaz sound the same way. And then when you work together... And an actor delivers a line, and it's, it's how you hear it is maybe different as to how they delivered it. And then you're stuck in a room, and they wind up saying, "Can you give me three, uh, three renditions of your line?" Oh, okay, so it becomes uh, it becomes literally like a puzzle that they have to put together rather than us all working together, which is great fun. And we're having great fun talking to Michael Bell. Michael Bell, one of the most prolific voice actors in film and animation. You can follow Michael on Twitter, Michael's website, michaelbellvoices.com. Great. Yep. A lot of people a lot of people don't realize that there was a Lost in Space cartoon, at least one, yeah. and that you were the lead in that. Do you yeah. remember what that? You know, it, there has been there are those that, that stand out in my mind, because I've guessed it on so much stuff. You know, I guessed it on Scooby-Doo. I've guessed it on, in, well, I think I was a regular on the Humanoids, but I guessed it on, on a number of shows. 
that uh, half the time I didn't know years later when somebody says to me, do you remember when you said that? Excuse <laughs> me? Get a life. <laughs> Go outside. There's a world out there. Do I remember a line that I did in 1982 as a character? I don't remember that. I mean, I have people who stop by my booth when I do uh, comic Con because they love Soul Reaver, one of the games I did. And I did uh, character Raziel, the lead in Soul Reaver. And they say, oh, say that line about going to hell. I said, what? What are you talking about? I have no idea. Tell me what it is and I'll do it. I can't remember that. Well, because you're underscoring a point that we talk about a lot on our show, Michael, is that as a working actor, you know, and if you're lucky to be as as busy as you were and, and as you are, you know, when you go from one thing to another, you don't always remember what you're doing, you know, in episode seven or episode 73, because it's it's like asking you what you had for breakfast that day in 1972. Exactly. It's the exact same thing. So, I, listen, I, I understand that there are favorites that the fans have, and they remember something something in particular. I, I certainly remember Chaz in the movie saying, we're going to need a bigger boat, but that's obvious. Uh, you know, the things that I, I don't recall, I don't remember what Zan said other than, form up! <laughs> that's all I can recall. And, uh, and uh, when people say, oh, my God, you were... Uh, you were grouchy smurf. Oh, I can't because I have a jacket. And they go, you were grouchy smurf? And I go, yeah. Couldn't you do grouchy? I said, sure. Are we there yet? <laughs> or, I hate smurfette. You know, whatever it is. The line that I remember you from is probably obscure too, but when you were on the monkeys, you said, you can't be an artist. You got no beard. So there you go. <laughs> now, funny thing about the monkeys was uh, when... Uh, Mickey leaped on, I didn't like the guys. I hope they're not listening. I think a couple of them passed away, so I know they're not listening. But uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't like the guys particularly. I thought they were just unruly kids and not that clever. And I was getting annoyed at their antics on the set, and they just couldn't concentrate. And, and of course, they were putting up with it because they were the money bags. All yeah. the producers and directors were putting up with them. They would laugh at everything they said like you would laugh at a child. And at one point, I had to do something where I had to leap on his back and and I leapt on his back, and he started to scream in that thing, and I also bit his ear, which was unexpected. I thought I would take it out on his lobe. <laughs> well, we, we've done a couple of programs on on the monkeys, and if I remember correctly, the show you did was in the second year, which was a totally different um, vibe on the show. Rose Marie told us, I mean, she did both. she did both the first year and the second year, and she said the first year... They were very nice. They were nice. They were nice boys. I'm, I'm, I can't do a. I can't do a Rosemary, but uh, she, they were nice boys because it was new to them, and this was before. Right. This is before everything exploded. And when she went back to the set the second year, the the vibe was kind of like what you just described, where they thought they knew everything. And oh, uh, they were not. They were not clever kids. They weren't clever at all, and they were nasty. They acted. You know, abusive, like some crazy rock group, and they'd go to hotels and they'd throw things out the window. I mean, they were just outrageous because people allowed them to be. Yeah, they, they were the money train, and they and I think somebody told me eventually they did sing, but the original songs they didn't sing. That was Bobby and his group that sang. And, uh, they Voice didn't and heart, sing the yeah. Original last train to wherever or something. I mean, they, they, that wasn't them. I was a big fan. Needless to say, it was work. I was working. All I cared about was. At that point, I, was, I think I went on the contract Universal and, and then started a freelance. And I, I was working. That's all I really cared about. And uh, all we really care about is that uh, we're talking to Michael Bell. Uh, Michael Bell, one of the most enduring voice actors in film and television. Michael will be back next week for part two of our conversation. We will talk about some of his other credits in film and TV animation. Plus, we will ask him about working on such popular primetime shows as Dallas, The Rockford Files, and The Streets of San Francisco. All that and more next week on TV Confidential. Michael's website, michaelbellvoices.com. michaelbellvoices.com. We'll take a quick time out, then we will be back with more TV Confidential right after this. Buying or selling a home can be one of the most stressful things we'll ever do in life, but it doesn't have to be. And no one knows better than our friends at Front Porch Realty Group. 
Their community of realtors serving the Northern Bay Area of California that cares about their clients as individuals first and foremost. Whether you're a first-time buyer or looking to lease or sell your property in the Bay Area, Front Porch Realty Group will help you through this important transition by providing you with the right information for your situation while lessening the pain. They also work with a network of realtors throughout California who provide the same high caliber of customer service. Call Front Porch Realty Group at 415-886-7411 for a realtor referral near you. You can also visit their website, frontporchrealtygroup.com, for more information on the services they provide, including upcoming workshops and seminars. For more information, call 415-886-7411 or visit frontporchrealtygroup.com. Front Porch Realty Group. They'll find the solution that works best for you. Want a free first ride with Uber? Uber, the mobile app that connects you with a ride at the touch of a button in minutes. Enter promo code TV Confidential after you download the app to receive your first free ride up to $20. For more information, go to get.uber.com forward slash go forward slash TV Confidential. Hey there, this is Wink Martindale, and you're listening to TV Confidential. Attention sports fans, now you can watch every football game you want all season long without leaving your home with Dish for about 50 bucks a month. Compared to your cable bill, you can save almost $600 a year. Call right now and sign up for Dish and watch every football game you want. With Dish, there are no boxes to pay, plus get free installation as soon as tomorrow if you call now. And with Dish Anywhere, you can watch your favorite sports and channels on your smartphone, tablet, or laptop. Be one of the first 100 orders right now and get a free voice remote. Don't miss a single football game all year long and save a ton of money. Get a free voice remote and free installation as soon as tomorrow. But you got to call All American Dish right now. 800-296-1251. 800-296-1251. 800-296-1251. That's 800-296-1251. Miss the show? We have more than 500 hours of archived editions of TV Confidential available on demand as digital downloads. For more information, go to shop.tvconfidential.net. This portion of TV Confidential is sponsored by The Misadventures of Biffle and Schuster, the hilarious site-splitting new DVD available through Kino Lorber.